Turn, if you will, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. I don't usually preach a textual sermon, but this is the introduction into the series, and you'll see why I'm doing what I'm doing this morning. My subject is entitled Christian Ethics. Christian Ethics. Here's the text. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. I'm not going to break that text down yet. I'll do that in conclusion this morning. The Greek word for ethics is ethos. It is used only one time in all the scriptures, and this is the place where it is used. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Look at the text again. Evil communications. We'll give what that means. Corrupt good manners. I'm going to have to go ahead and say something that will pave the way. The word is manners here. Good manners. It can mean morals or character. That's the word ethos, from which we get the word ethics. Christian ethics. We see a manifestation of little Christian ethics today. There are some things being taught and preached that just ought not to be taught and preached by persons who claim to be God's representatives. There is what is known today as antinomianism. And we'll be dealing with that point this morning. But Christian ethics, what all is included in Christian ethics? We're talking about Christian morals. We're talking about Christian character. No one can deny that morality is the fruit of regeneration and conversion. No one can expect to produce any real morality apart from the grace of God. If persons who have been seized by God's grace need no instruction in morality, as some advocate today, did you hear what I said? Inspired instruction for Christians was a waste of time when they had been given to us by the prophets and the apostles of old. Beloved, the Bible is filled with instruction for Christians. Just because we are the recipients of God's grace does not relieve us of the responsibility of being subjected to the instruction the Holy Spirit has given to you and me through holy men as they were inspired of God to give us this instruction. You say, well, what's being taught? Stay with me. We'll see. Surely no one will have the audacity to say inspired information about morality is not needed by believers today. Every believer stands in need of instruction. He needs the commands that our Lord has given And I'm not just referring to the Ten Commandments, the moral law. Or I should say the moral aspect of the law. The law has three aspects. The law has three parts. And I'm talking about the law of the Old Testament. We have the ceremonial law. We have the the judicial aspect of the law. And we have the moral aspect of the law. The moral aspect of the law is just as important for you and me today as it was the day that it was first given to Moses. 
some strange fire in the area of Christian ethics is proclaimed today. And believers must be forewarned in order to be forearmed. Having said that, Christian ethics is the subject that I have chosen to preface our study of 1 Corinthians chapter 7. On marriage and celibacy, marriage and separation, marriage and expediency, marriage and contentment, marriage and remarriage. Now I've given you the divisions, haven't I? Turn with me, if you will, please, first of all, to Romans 13.10. Today, this statement in verse 10 is being taken by individuals. And they're saying what ought never to be said about the verse. Paul taught that love is the fulfilling of the law. We'll look at More than just that statement later on, but not now. Look at the statement in the latter part of verse 10. Love is the fulfilling of the law. Because this statement has been greatly misunderstood, it must be properly interpreted. And I'm seeking this morning by the grace of God to give it the proper interpretation in the light of all the revelation of God's mind. Some think that love in this verse means to abrogate the law. But there is a difference between fulfilling, and actually that's not the word that should be used, fulfillment, it's a noun. It's not a an action word that is used here in the text. I'm talking about the Greek text. So it's not the fulfilling, it's not an action word, it's a noun. And the word that is used here by Paul is pleroma. However, some think that love means to abrogate the law. But I stated there is a difference between fulfillment and nullification. I said there's a difference between fulfillment and nullification. The Greek word for fulfilling, as I've already stated, is pleroma, a noun, is used with the descriptive genitive namu, which means fulfillment of law. So it would be correct to say the fulfillment of law. Love that has been poured out in one's heart by the spirit of regeneration is devoted to the negative commandments as much as he is devoted to the positive commandments. What do you think the Apostle John meant in the last verse of his first epistle? Beloved, keep yourselves from idols. Beloved, I am as devoted as a recipient of God's grace to that commandment as I am. Love the Lord with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. Stay with me because we'll open up some things that you may not be aware of that's being taught today. Apart from love, and I'm talking about agape love, I'm talking about the love of God that has been shed abroad in your heart and mind in regeneration, is meaningless. I said obedience. Apart from agape love is meaningless. But in love, the Christian's obedience is expressive. What do you mean by the believer's obedience being expressive? 
Listen to this in Romans 8. When Paul said that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. That's Romans 8, 4. Again we have in 1 John 5, 3. For this is the love of God. That we keep his commandments. Notice the last part. For his commandments are not grievous. Law to a righteous person is not a burden. Beloved, it is the believer's delight. Now let me ask you a question. Is God's commandments your delight? Whether they be positive or negative. Are they your delight? You know what David said in the 119th division of the Psalms? I love thy law, O Lord. Later on in the same Psalm, I hate every evil way. So God's commandments are not burdensome to us as Christians. God's commandments are our delight. And if God's commandments are not our delight, then we don't have the grace of God. Agape love has never been shed abroad in our hearts. We're being hypocritical about what we claim to believe. Let's go another step. Modern day antinomianism is the same old heresy expressed in a new or in a new terminology. The question is often asked today, can one be under law's obligation without being under its condemnation? How would you answer that? Can one be under the obligation of the law without being under its condemnation? They say if you're under the condemnation, you're under the obligation. If you're under the obligation, you're under the condemnation. Then they turn that around. But if you have been delivered by grace, you are free from both the obligation and condemnation. That's where antinomianism was born. Beloved, you better think with me. So those who argue in favor of being free from the law claim that since the believer delights to do what is good, he does not need the law. Have you reached a place in your Christian life where you feel that you do not need God's commandments, God's law, God's instruction? Let's carry that line of logic to its proper conclusion. Will you permit me to do that? That line of logic would lead one to conclude that since faith is the gift of God... He doesn't need the gospel that he is to embrace. Are you with me? If I have been delivered by God's grace from the responsibility of the law, therefore I do not need the law, Then because God has given me grace, I don't need the gospel. 
which I am to embrace. You see where that leads, do you not? The goodness of the law is experienced only, only as it is put to proper use. Proper use. Its improper use becomes an unbearable burden which ultimately becomes a curse. Now, what did Israel do? God gave the law to a redeemed people. The law was not given to Israel until after Israel's deliverance from Egyptian bondage. The law, therefore, came alongside of. And that's the teaching of Galatians chapter 3. Until the seed should come to whom the promise was made. So the law was given to a redeemed people. Now, what did the Jews do? The unsaved Jews took that which was given as a sequel to Israel's deliverance and made it a means of salvation. When the Jews took that which was given as a sequel to her deliverance and made it a means of her salvation... She was mishandling the law. Beloved, that is the legalist. When someone accuses you of legalism, listen closely, I want you to be in a position to ask that person, will you explain to me what legalism is? And you're going to find out... A legalist is one who takes what God has given as a sequel to salvation and makes it a means of salvation. That's the legalist. That's the legalist. But beloved, I am not taking what God has given to me as a sequel to my deliverance and making it as a means of my salvation. I'm taking that which God has given to me as a sequel to my salvation and using it as a guide for my life as a Christian. See the difference? Quite a difference. Admittedly, the law cannot legislate righteousness. You see, the antinomian comes along and he says, Now, wait a minute. The law cannot legislate righteousness. I'll be the first to admit that. But I'll tell you what the law can do and what it does do. It surely can restrain sin to some extent. You notice what I said? Now, I'm going to make this very practical. If you don't think the law restrains sin to some extent, then you do not understand the meaning of the law, but I'm going to prove to you that you're wrong if you have that concept. How many of you driving down the highway and you don't have your speed control on and you see a highway patrol? How many of you look at your speedometer? (laughs) You ever look at it? Why do you look at it? Why in the world do you take time to look at your speedometer? You know why. What I'm showing is, and I'm using a very crude illustration, but the reason you look at your speedometer is because you want to know how fast you're going. And if you're going too fast and you see him pull somebody over, you know what you'll automatically do? I know because I've done it. I slow down. I may not get back to right 55. You say, well, are you one who speeds? No, I set my, if I'm going to Centerville, I usually set my speedometer on somewhere and try to go with the flow of the traffic. If the flow of the traffic is going about 58, I just set my speed control on 58. I just go along with the flow of the traffic. And they won't stop you. 
I don't drive 70 or 75, but I go along with the flow of the traffic as a rule. But what I'm showing is, law does restrain disobedience to some extent. But you see, the antinomian comes along and he says, we're not under law. After all, you can't legislate righteousness. The Christian does not view the law as a means of salvation, but as a sequel to his salvation. That's the difference in being free and being a legalist. Listen to what our Lord says in John 14, 15. And beloved, this is not legalism. This is a manifestation of the Christian life. This is a manifestation of grace. If you love me, keep my commandments. Christ said that to his disciples. Legalism, therefore, is the abuse of the law by relying on keeping it for salvation. Christ's perfect obedience to the law for the elect's justification does not exempt God's elect from obedience to it not for salvation, but for their progressive sanctification. I don't obey the law for my justification. My obedience to the law is for my progressive sanctification. The moral law of God, which grew out of its nature, cannot be changed. And the moral law grew out of the very nature of the sovereign God. And that which grew out of his nature can never be changed. Christ said in Matthew 22, 37 through 39, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, he said. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now go back to Romans 13. Let's put verses 9 and 10 together and see what the antinomian does with the latter part. Paul instructed the Roman saints. Paul instructed those who had already been made free by the grace of God. Thus he was giving the same instruction to them as the seek as their sequel, the sequel to their salvation. Notice what he says. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not commit adultery. We are living in a society that is adulterous. We are living in an adulterous society. And preachers are afraid to take a stand. Because they'll lose too many church members. He also says, Thou shalt not kill. Notice now he's giving some of the commandments of Exodus 20. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Notice this, love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling, and it should be the fulfillment of the law. It's a noun, not an action word. Love for God and neighbors cannot be changed. Furthermore, the moral law can neither be abolished nor superseded. You can't abolish the moral law. You cannot supersede the moral law. God cannot dispense with the laws that are moral in themselves because they came from His very character. However, the substance, Jesus Christ, has filled the place of the shadows of the ceremonial law, Romans 10.4, Christ is the end of the law to everyone who believes. He's the end of the ceremonial law. 
or the ceremonial aspect of the law. He's not the end of the moral law. Furthermore, neither has God annulled unto us the judicial law in some aspects of it, but he has annulled the judicial law in the aspects that pertain to the nation of Israel. And we've been looking at some of those in recent days, and I shouldn't have to point them out. We don't stone people for adultery today. We don't stone them to death. We don't stone fornicators, to name a few. Now I'd like you to turn with me to Romans 7, 12. Romans 7 and verse 12. God's laws, unlike man-made laws, are holy and just and good. Now this was written by Paul after the deliverance of the Roman church members from the corruption and condemnation of sin. Now, if one could conceive of all the laws of man incarnate in a judge sitting on his bench, he would have some idea of the truth of every law of God finding its source in the Holy One Himself. Now, can you just visualize, just pause for a moment. Take, first of all, all the man-made laws. And you incorporate all of the man-made laws into the judge who is sitting on the bench. If you can visualize that, then think about all the laws of God that are holy and just and good as coming from Him who is the very source of that which is good and holy. Now let's make a comparison between the judge sitting on the bench and God sitting on His throne in heaven. If a judge who is supposed to represent, that is, be a representative, and to uphold the laws of men, suppose some criminal has been brought before his court and found guilty of a heinous crime. And the jury is brought in. And the foreman of the jury stands and says, We have found so-and-so guilty of this heinous crime. Then the judge says, you have, been, you have been found guilty, but as the judge of this court, I pronounce you free. You may go from this court a free man. What do you think would happen to that judge? He'd be impeached, or he ought to be impeached for not upholding the laws that he is supposed to be representing. Now, God's laws are holy, they're just, and they're good. And every man is a disobedient individual to God's laws. There is not a person living who has not transgressed God's law. But I want you to know God in grace, notice what I'm saying, in grace can pronounce you a guilty sinner. And He can say to you, you may go from my court, as it were, a free person. Go and sin no more. And God cannot be impeached. Well, what's the difference? Oh, quite a difference. God who made the law sent forth His Son and what the law could not do in that it was weak through the instrumentality of sinful flesh, the Holy God has done for the elect what they could not do for themselves. Therefore, Jesus Christ has satisfied every requirement of that law for you and for me. And therefore, on the basis of His finished work, God can say, you can go forth from my court a free man, go and sin no more. 
and God cannot be impeached. The God who made the law condescended to fulfill the law's requirement for the elect. Now, a human judge cannot do that. Cannot do that. Now, let's go a step further. Man-made laws are connected with morality. Even our man-made laws are connected with morality. But there are different concepts of morality. Not only among the nations of the world, but among the same people within a given nation. Not everyone in the United States of America has the same concept of morality. And the people of this nation do not have the same concept of morality that they have in Russia or in India or in the Far East. Stay with me. What's wrong? I want to show you the difference between Christianity and humanism. Are you ready for it? Christianity and humanism conflict worldwide. Humanistic laws are giving society today a new morality which strikes against biblical morality. And that's why I'm disturbed. Even by the antinomian teaching to which many Christians are being subjected in our day. And I want you to know a lot of Christians are just caving in. They're just caving in. But by God's grace, I'm not going to cave in. So humanistic laws are giving us a new morality which is contrary to biblical morality. I get so sick and tired of hearing people say, well, but keep in mind, we're living in 1986. We do things differently today than from the way our parents did them 50 years ago. Yes, but it's 50 times worse. 50 times worse. You see, lawmakers, most of them are depraved people. Let's face it. Let's admit it. But you know what the humanist lawmakers are saying today? They want to make remake society, in other words. They want to remake our society. And I'm using a statement by one. We want to free people from prejudice, from ignorance, from crime. And from war. Doesn't that sound good? Doesn't that sound good? A lot of people are falling for it. Stay with me. Humanism relies on democracy, which has its own brand of authoritarianism. I'm getting sick and tired about many politicians in this country wanting to use our democratic form of government and try to impose it upon every nation in the world. We're not setting a very good example over here. And our humanistic lawmakers are trying to build a society over here. That's a new society, a new morality, which is contrary to biblical morality. Now, beloved, I shouldn't have to illustrate this. I could just spend the rest of the time this morning and an hour tonight just giving you one example after the other of things to which we are subjected on the boob tube. Just listen to the news today. Many think the voice of the people is the voice of God. And there are a lot of folk today in America who are so foolish that they think the voice of the people or the voice of democracy is the voice of God Himself. 
But I have news for you. Are you listening? But like the Laodiceans, the people become the God of democracy. What kind of laws are being passed today? The kind of laws that the majority of the people in America want. So the people have become the God of democracy. That's why I long for the time, beloved, when Jesus Christ comes and He reigns as King of kings and Lord of lords because the only perfect form of government is not a democracy. It's a theocracy. Government under Jehovah God. All that I've said indicates that nothing according to human democracy can stand in the way of the people. All who hold the biblical concept of morality today are looked upon as being social deviants. Did you know that? You're looked upon as being a social deviant if you don't go along with a sexual revolution. And I heard a, no, not a preacher, excuse me, a false prophet say this morning, and you see, he only gave just part of the truth of the case. He told about a young woman that had had a baby. She had to have a blood transfusion, and as a result of the blood transfusion, she contracted AIDS. And her father had come to him asking for prayer for his daughter who had AIDS. After having said that, because he has the power of positive thinking, he said, I don't want to hear anybody say that AIDS is God's judgment because of the lifestyle of today. He is not even a wife. He is an idiot. If that doesn't get you stirred up, what will? You see what he's doing? Now, what he should have said was that what happened to this woman is just a byproduct of God's judgment, of God's judgment upon the lifestyle of the homosexuals. But he didn't say that. Brother, we better start listening. We better start thinking. And our thinking better be in tune with God's Word. Now let's go to our educational systems. Educational systems today are creating restlessness rather than promoting tranquility. You mean our educational systems? That's what I said. Systems, plural. Humanistic education is designed to establish the will of man as the ultimate authority. And I challenge anybody to refute that. Any philosophy that denies the authority of Scripture promotes subjectivity. It stresses human freedom to be able to choose correctly and to create a subjectivity, a subjectively meaningful society. And I'm quoting them. I'm quoting some of the higher educators. Such philosophy relies on existentialism rather than biblical supernaturalism. You say, well, what is existentialism? Very simple definition. Existentialism is the human philosophy that makes human experience the norm for judging reality. So the chaos that has been brought about, even as the result of the educational systems of today, cannot reverse the chaos that exists. So the system that is brought it about cannot remedy the chaos that has been brought about by the system. 
It's a humanistic philosophy. Let's go a step further. Subjectivism is not the authority for determining what is true. Although institutional churches are filled with subjectivists, and I hope this one isn't. Listen, because I want you to make an application of what I'm going to say now. I don't believe in just studying and teaching, and I'm preached to all week long by God's Word. So I expect to preach to you. Not to please or to tickle your ears, but to preach to you as the Word of God has preached to me all week. Therefore, subjectivism is not the authority for determining what is true. And I said, although institutional churches are filled with subjectivists, few are willing to admit it. What if I were to tell you this morning that many of us are subjectivists, but we're not willing to admit it? What would you say? Stay with me for a moment. Why is no one willing to allow subjectivism to operate in the sphere of mathematics? But he will permit it in the sphere of biblical principles. Everyone has the right to believe whatever he wants to believe. Whatever you believe, that's all right. What if I told you that 2 plus 5 equals 3? Does everyone have a right to believe that? I've tried to bring this to a conclusion. Listen to this. So the subjectivists today who will not tolerate it in one sphere will tolerate it when it comes to what? The sphere of professing Christendom. And they don't want to say anything to offend anybody. You just believe whatever you want to believe. I'm not going to open my peeper. I don't want to make an enemy. Each businessman is not permitted to subjectively form his own system of relationships. Is he? Why? Because commerce would collapse. And that would lead to social chaos. On the other hand, subjectivism is unrestrained in spiritual things by religionists. They think they have the right to express themselves things of which they know little or absolutely nothing. I'll tell you what I'm doing now. I don't know when I'll preach it, but I'm already working. I've got a message about half prepared. You see, when I get into an area and things come to my mind, I just start making notes, and I start dealing with it, and then I lay it aside, and later on I'll get to it. I don't know how many would be willing to take this. I think that people in this church could take it, I hope. There are not many church members today who are qualified to interpret the Scriptures. Do you think that one? Will you think that one through for a moment? I'll go further. There are a lot of preachers who are not qualified. They don't even give time to the study of the Scriptures. Now I would like you to turn with me to Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Let's look at another passage that is used by antinomians. And those who are saying, we're not under the law... We've been delivered from the condemnation, the judgment of the law, therefore we're not under its responsibility. Will you read with me? Beginning with verse 22. Here's another passage that must be properly interpreted. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, now, here's the phrase. Here's the statement. Against such there is no law. 
How would you interpret that? Against such there is no law. What is Paul saying? There is no law against the virtues of the Spirit mentioned by Paul. He's talking about virtues. The apostle had been battling the legalizers who desired a ceremonial law or a ceremonial mold to regulate their religious lives. Now, I said legalizers. It was these legalizers that he had been battling. Hence, they preferred an external law to the inward principle of grace. Go back to Galatians 4.21. Here's another verse to study in connection with it. And it too is misinterpreted. Paul had previously asked, Tell me, you who want to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? That's the New American Standard Bible's translation of the verse. Those who desired to be under the law were legalizers. Hence they made what God had given, as we've already stated, a sequel to the deliverance of his people, the means of their deliverance. Now let's go into this a little bit. Contrary to the legalizers who live under the principle of the law, or seek to, Christians live in the realm, in the realm of the principle, of the spirit of regeneration, which is the spirit of grace. I'll give you two verses for that. John 3, 8 and Hebrews 10, 29. Then look at verse 24 of Galatians 5. Paul said, Therefore, they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Now let's put all this together. Let's put verses 22 and 23 and 24 along with chapter 4 and verse 21. Put them all together. What is Paul teaching? You and I have put Jesus Christ to death when he came the first time. We were not here actually, but our sins helped nail him to the cross. He was actually nailed to the cross by the hands of wicked men. But it was for our sins that his soul was made a sacrifice. So through lawless men, he was slain. And this is an area active indicative in Acts 2.23 of the verb and I rail, which means to put to death, kill, or murder. They killed him. They murdered him. But your sins and mine have put him on the tree. But let's not stop there. Then when you turn to Galatians 5 and verse 24, Yes, it is true that we have nailed him to the cross. But now since the grace of God has come into our hearts and lives, what do we do by the Spirit of grace? Here it is. Verse 24. What do we do? We crucify the flesh with its affections and lusts. And the verb here for crucify is an aorist active indicative of storao, which means to crucify or to mortify. So what do we do? We mortify the passions and lusts of the flesh. Christ's objective work at Calvary became a subjective experience in our hearts. Is that true? So the objective work of the Lord Jesus has become a subjective experience in our hearts, thus enabling us by grace to mortify. I'm talking about Christian ethics, beloved. Therefore, the Christian is not compelled to duty. I'm not compelled to duty. I've had church members through the years say the preacher just expects too much of us. Beloved, what a foolish statement. What I expect of you is not what God expects of you. 
What I expect of myself is not what God expects of me. I'm not compelled to duty by the energy of the flesh. But listen, I am impelled. I am impelled by the internal grace of God to do what I ought to do as a Christian to glorify the matchless name of my Savior. If you think you're being compelled, you need to stop and analyze what you have. If you have grace, you're impelled. You're impelled by the internal grace of God to do something. You're not compelled by an external force, but you're impelled by internal grace to live for Jesus Christ. Now, a warning must be given to those who have been made free by grace. I wish I could say that all of us have been made free by grace who are here this morning. True freedom becomes actualized in submission. What do you mean? Listen to what I said. True freedom, true freedom becomes actualized in submission. The fact that we as Christians are not our own does not cast a shadow over our freedom, but enables us to manifest our freedom in joyful reality. I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. Therefore, I glorify God in my body. Isn't that what Paul talks about in the 6th chapter of 1 Corinthians, before he gets to the seventh chapter. The body is not made for fornication. It's the temple of the Holy Spirit. What am I talking about? Christian ethics. Christian character. Christian morals, if you please. So this is the freedom. From something lesser to something greater. This is the freedom from something lesser to something greater. Turn to Romans 8. Let's read verses 2 and 3 together. Paul said, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Freedom, true freedom, is not the product of human action, human action, but the unsolicited act of the grace of the sovereign God. I'm free. Turn, if you will, please, to Romans 7, uh, 1 Corinthians 7.22. We'll be looking at this later, but I have to use it this morning. So Christians are free in Christ. But you know we're also slaves of Christ. How in the world can I be free and a slave at the same time? I don't expect you, if you're lost, to understand that. The Christian is free from the law. But he's a slave in Christ. The word is doulos. Paul said, I'm a slave of Christ. I'm enslaved to Christ. All right, look at 1 Corinthians 7.22. Paul said, for he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free man. Likewise, also he that is called, being free, is Christ's servant, and the Greek word for servant is doulos, which means a slave. I'm free, but I'm a slave. Therefore, true freedom comes in submission to Jesus Christ as His slave. And that's the only place true freedom is. Here's a person who says, I'm free, and I'm going to live as a free person. I'm going to do what I please. If I want to live with a dozen men, or if I want to live with a dozen women, that's my business. I'm free. 
Oh, no, you're not. You're a slave of sin. And the devil is your father. And you'll end up in hell. But the person who has been made free by grace is a slave of Christ. And the only true freedom is being a slave of Christ. Let's go further. As Christ slaves, self-expression. Now here's a very good point I want to make. Self-expression apart from control. Self-expression apart from control cannot be visibly permitted. Let me illustrate that. Objective principles must be translated into subjective actions. I'm going to use a very simple illustration. When a child gets old enough to go to public school, first of all, the child learns the ABCs. And I assume they still learn the multiplication table. It's as these things become a part of the constitution of the child that the child begins to know what freedom of education is. Beloved, it is only, listen to me, it is only as the Word of God the great doctrinal truths of Holy Scripture, the objective revelation of the mind of God, becomes ours. And it becomes our, part of our constitution, so to speak, that we begin to enjoy and know what freedom is. What am I saying? I'm saying the more of Holy Scripture we know, the objective truth is translated into subjective actions. And only as objective truth is translated into objective actions do we really know what true freedom really is. And the more you know, and the more in tune your actions are with the mind of God, the greater freedom you enjoy. Now I close with this. Let's go to our text again. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 32. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Be not deceived. Now Paul was writing to the Christians at Corinth. Don't you be deceived. Be not deceived. What does he say? Evil communications corrupt good manners. We're talking about Christian ethics. The word ethics comes from the word ethos. And it's translated manners here in 1 Corinthians 15.33. He says, be not deceived. Evil communications. Communications here is the nominative plural of homilia which means companionship, intercourse, or communion. So your companionship with the wrong people will corrupt a good character. I'm talking about Christian ethics. Then let's look at the word ethos. It's the accusative plural of ethos that's used here, which means custom, morals, or character. Now, this is another way of saying, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. 2 Corinthians 6.14. Inward separation results from outward separation. Beloved, if you're not inwardly separated, you'll never be outwardly separated. Just that simple. There can be no safety among those in whose hearts there is no fear of God. And if you associate 
and become companions with those in whose hearts there is no fear of God sooner or later. You or I will be corrupted in character. Keeping away from evil society is much easier. I said keeping away from evil society is much easier than being in its stream and trying to battle against it. Let me use this illustration in conclusion. Have you ever seen a river that's just raging as a result of a flood? Just the current is swift. And it's a raging torrent. I remember back in 1942, I was pastor up in Jackson, Missouri. And we had a radio broadcast at Cape Girardeau, a little station at Cape Girardeau. Came a terrible flood in the spring, and the Mississippi River was everywhere. Even got up into many businesses in Cape Girardeau. It was a torrent, just a raging torrent. I'll tell you what. I would rather be on the shore looking at the raging raging torrent than to be out there in it and having to battle against it. And every person who is saved by the grace of God, there is inward separation. And we cannot associate and have companions with people who have no fear of God without our lives being contaminated, without us being corrupted. The Lord alone could be in the midst of people like that without ever being touched or influenced. But you see, we still have the old nature. And you know as well as I do, there's not a one of you sitting out there who has not on the job or somewhere. You've been with people and you've listened to them talk, and before you realize it, you might be saying something or thinking about things You might have said something that you should never have said, and you might be thinking about things you never should have thought. Why? Because, because a lack of separation. What am I talking about? Christian ethics. Let's look at the verse again. Paul said, be not deceived. Evil communications or evil companionships will corrupt a good character. Our good morals. Was it necessary for Paul to write what he wrote to the Corinthians? Yes, beloved. You and I need the same warnings, the same instruction, the same commandments, both the positive and the negative. Next Sunday morning, we'll begin with verse 1 of 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Let's stand as we...